Okay, we had actually in the White Room, we had uh, really two stationary enemies. One of them was a countdown clock, which we can show you. And the other one was one or two TV cameras. Now the TV cameras were, we don't have one in here now, but they were actually there to uh, watch what we were doing or to make sure nothing else went wrong. But the countdown clock was actually all lifelong our enemy. Once you go into a time critical operation where you must perform certain functions at a specific time because the booster people have to do something, the range people have to do something, you have to do something, and you're always fighting that countdown clock. I'll give you a good example. Let's say if I want to check my pyrotechnics and see if they will ignite. Now I have to make sure that at that time the booster people don't send me a distress signal. So you see, you have to coordinate all your effort, and this is normally done in the procedures, the countdown books and so on. But you're always looking at the countdown clock like at T minus two hours, 15 minutes, you must do this. If nothing else, they will call a hold. Now, if they call a hold that is really detrimental to the launch operations and may also cost your money, your, your company money, because uh, you're delaying operations. So all life long, when we were on the pad or when we were even in the altitude chamber, anywhere we were, a countdown clock was really your silent enemy. You lived and you died by the countdown clock. So the same way with the TV camera, if you ever did something you didn't want somebody else to know, you would uh, see that one of your technicians accidentally would stand in front of it and you could do little things that uh, weren't quite in the plan. Now, uh, I was sometimes asked as to what happened when uh, we went to these T0 and it didn't go. <clears throat> now at that time, Wally was, Wally Shirawa was sitting in the uh, Titan and he had two choices. He could evacuate by using the ejection seat. However, ejection seat performance was somewhat on the uh, not proven area. With other words, they would live most likely, but how well they would live was never too well established. Plus, there was another fact. If there was a big tail end fire and they would eject, the parachutes would deploy and the wind could blow them right into the fire, depending which way the wind was coming from. So that was not that much of an option, but Wally being the test pilot that he was, he had the D-ring in his hand. But his brain said, I don't see a problem. I don't have to do it now until I deduct that there is a problem. And they said later on, yes, he had ice water in his veins. But that is actually the true mark of a test pilot. You are used that things can go wrong and you hope you are trained to evaluate what went wrong and what your action needs to be. Luckily at that time, Wally did not choose to use the ejection seats, which we don't know how it would have turned out. So after that, I got a call and said, okay, we scrubbed for today. So that means I had to take my closeout crew and suit technicians, go back in, because the first thing we had to do after we had the hatches open, we have to pull. Each side had uh, at least eight safety pins in the pyrotechnic devices to save the seats. So we had to pull all our safety pins back in, then get the straps, the cables and everything off and get them out there. So it was not just, just say, hey, jump out. No, you had to be careful how you did that. When would they have uh, depressurized the tanks then? after you got everybody cleared? Yeah. No, they would, flight pressure of the tanks was after, after the structure was down and we had cleared, yes.